All right, thanks for the introduction. Thanks also to the organizers for having me here for the kind invitation. And I decided uh, very recently to uh, report today on some work uh, I did with, um, jointly with Andreas Klappenecker and uh, Pradeep Savpali. Uh, Pradeep was a summer intern at NEC this year and uh, it was great to have him there. And uh, sometimes I get in a rut about some problems and I make, don't make any progress. And he came and completely swept me away and uh, had me start I knew about a lot of things. So, um, yeah, so I, I, what I want to um, start with is um, a problem which was already mentioned at this workshop at least twice. Namely, um, it's an interesting observation that in a, in a lot of physical scenarios, you don't have a completely symmetric error model, right? So, you, in particular, your Z have met a lot, of, at a lot higher frequency than your X errors and your Y errors. All right, so um, it's a natural question to ask if we can exploit that somehow in a code design. Right? So John asked that question in his talk, also Panos asked that question in, in his talk. And they have a, a very nice way to address it and I hope that we have a contribution here too to make uh, to that problem. So um, in particular, as you probably know, in many systems the relaxation time is much higher than the defacing time. Examples are for instance NMR, uh, where this, this gap can be about a factor of 100, I found in the literature. Also in superconducting qubits, of course, the time scales are at a different order of magnitude there, but again, the gap between the T1 and the T2 times are about a factor of 100. And uh, the reason for this probably comes from the fact that there are completely different physical processes which are responsible for relaxation and defacing. John mentioned in his talk that um, defacing is more, much more has much more to do with the effect of low frequency noise in the environment, whereas relaxation has to do with the energy splittings in your in your system. So um, it has been asked by many people uh, how to to um, exploit that. So I, I would like to highlight this paper by Levi Offer and Mark Mezard from last year. It got, got published this year. Uh, other people asked this question too, and, and recently a paper, a very nice paper by by uh, Panos and John Preskill addressed this problem. And also I would like to, uh, to put a pointer to, these, to the talks of these two guys. So the first question is, um, how exactly is it that uh, uh, this gap between T1 and T2 time translates into an asymmetry of X and Z errors? Right? So we are a bunch of nutty computer scientists. We don't know much about actual physical uh, channels. So we'd like to understand that. And the first thing we realized is it's not as simple as that the T1 exactly corresponds to the probability of an X error and T2 corresponds to probability of a Z error. So there is actually something more uh, difficult happening here. Uh, a process which causes relaxation actually contributes to both X and Z. So we try to understand what's going on here and I want to start this talk by actually motivating this a little bit. This, how does the gap between T1 and T2 translate into a gap between these, these X and Z errors? What I want to do then, and this will be the bulk of the talk, is present a few constructions of quantum codes that those will be quantum codes as you know them, those will be stabilizer codes, but codes which exploit this asymmetry. So these codes will have a natu very natural imbalancedness towards the Z errors. Okay, and I, I will give a bunch of constructions of, of such codes and um, also present performance simulations we did. And at the end, if there's enough time, I will uh, compare this with other approaches which, has been re which have been recently proposed. Okay, as a motivating example, let's look at the following uh, channel with the cross operators given here. Okay, so uh, th this, is, uh, this has an amplitude damping component, namely uh, mainly responsible to this guy, and a dephasing component responsible for this cross operator. Okay, let's look at the, the, the quantum channel having these three cross operators. And you can, uh, there are a bunch of parameters involved and you see that the parameters T1 and T2 here, they show up in the, in the definition of these cross operators. Okay, what does this channel do? If you apply it to a, a state on one qubit row, um, you will get this resulting state and here you see quite clearly that after some time, these uh, elements start to die off. If the time is about of the order T2, these off-diagonal terms will start to die off. That makes the state classical. If you're at the order T1, then you will actually have 
completely lost any any information about your system, he would be in the ground state. And you see that here, after you're greater than T1, very likely the state will be just the, the ground state. Okay, so how exactly do now uh, the probability of X, Y, Z are relate to this? Okay, this is nice, but, but what does this actually tell us? So I'm, I'm coming from background from stabilizer codes and as you know, people work for the depolarizing channel for that model, right? But here we have a channel which is not a depolarizing channel. It's, it's not, in fact, not even a Pauli channel. So the first question is, it's a very basic question, how can we map this to a Pauli channel, okay? Of course, people have tried to come up di with direct methods of, of uh, quantum codes for this particular channel, not going via the detour of mapping it to a Pauli channel, but this is the route we are going to take, and we want to we want to actually see how this uh, asymmetry in the X and Z error comes about for this case. All right, so that's the plan. So the, the question is how do we get a Pauli channel? And of course there is a, a very nice and straightforward map to map any channel to a Pauli channel. And this is, this is the twirling idea. Um, all right, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, so um, it's just to, to, to establish some notation here. Um, a depolarizing channel is a channel which uh, has only Pauli matrices as cross operators, X, Y, and Z. And for depolarizing channel, all of these X, Y, and Z errors are equal, equally probable, all right? You can have a more general Pauli channel, still the cross operators will be the Paulis, but you can assign some probabilities for each of them. Okay, so if you have, this is for one qubit, if you have several qubits, um, what, what happens if, if uh, it, it's very sim a very natural thing is to just look at tensor products of these Pauli matrices, implicitly you make the assumption, if you do that, you implicitly make the assumption that the noise affects the qubits independently, all right? And then you try to correct um, errors of a bounded weight. And uh, I'd like to put a pointer here to the talk of Daniel on the first day. Okay, so this is the context of Pauli channels. You've seen a channel which was not a Pauli ch channel, namely that amplitude damping channel. So how can we get a Pauli channel out of that? And here the idea is to do twirling. So, um, okay, how does twirling work? Uh, suppose you have a, an arbitrary channel with arbitrary cross operators, AK. I didn't put the completeness condition here, so they have to sum up to one, AK dagger times AK, the sum over that has to be one. And uh, this twirling idea has become very fashionable recently, even though it goes back quite a long way. I'm, uh, People have been using that maybe for 10 years in, in quantum information, probably longer in, in general. So there's a nice paper, for instance, by uh, David Di Vincenzo, David Leung, and um, I forgot, uh, Barbara Tejal, which introduced uh, Clifford twirling to map a channel to a desired form. Here we do something even simpler. We just do Pauli twirling, all right? So we just apply local Pauli operations to our, to our channel. And what happens is the following. Um, you can equivalently write your channel like this. So instead of using these cross operators, you just introduce a matrix, chi KL, and then you get a Pauli from the left, Pauli from the right, and this is an equivalent way of writing the channel. And if you do twirling, it will map it to a different channel, and all these off-diagonal, if you want, off-diagonal elements in that, in that chi will go away by doing that. And um, so as I said, this has become, uh, was, it's a, it's a very fashionable thing, this, this twirling idea. Uh, people have been doing, doing that in NMR experiments, for instance. Now they think about doing that in other systems as well. And um, so what you do to your system is actually something very simple. You just apply a random operation, in that case a random local operation, let the channel evolve, and then undo the exactly same operation. Right? It's important that you undo the same one. By doing that, you map your channel to a kind of an average channel. So, okay. And, and you see that this is now a Pauli channel. Right, there are no mixed terms anymore. This is indeed a Pauli channel. So we can do that for the uh, for the channel I presented before. This combined amplitude damping and dephasing channel, and what you get is a resulting channel, which is a Pauli channel. And let's have a look at the the probabilities for x, y, and z errors if after you you twirl the channel. So it's easy to work out. Here's the expression, and uh, in particular, you can look at the ratio of the probability for z error over probability for an X error. This is the expression you get, and if you look closely and look at a regime where you are much smaller than the, the um, relaxation time, this ratio is roughly two times the ratio over these two numbers, okay? So it indeed translates. This, uh, an asymmetry in that, uh, in T1 and T2, roughly translates into the same uh, ratio of the 
probability to get a Z error over an X error. I guess it must be very familiar to many. It was good for us, uh, very reassuring, to see that after we do these twirling things and work with the average channel, that still we have that asymmetry. If you like to think of it as in a, in, a, in a sort of a parameter space where you plot the probabilities for X, Y, Z errors, here the, um, the depolarizing channel sits in the, in the center of mass of, these, of this triangle, of all these triangles, uh, and an asymmetric channel will have a, a very strong bias towards one of the axes, in our case towards the Z X. Okay, so for this kind of channel, we have a, a much, much higher probability to observe, to have a Z error. Okay, so uh, next code constructions. How can we actually come up with a code which matches an imbalance like that? So um, we found that it's most natural to actually work with CSS codes to, to, to mimic that, to, to get an imbalance. And it's a very simple idea. You, um, uh, you do the CSS construction, so you come up with a stabilizer which looks like this. So you get a bunch of X-only generators, a bunch of Z-only generators. And as you know, the, the X-only generators correspond to a certain code. This is a parity check, parity check matrix of a classical code. And the Z generators are also taken from a classical code. And now it's a very natural idea to just make that X code much, much more powerful than the Z code. Okay, if you do that, then you will get much, much uh, more, um, many, many more um, X generators, and they, so that enables you to correct many, many more Z errors, of course, right? So, um, so the codes we have in mind are all of this type, okay? So uh, no general uh, stabilizer codes, just uh, in quotes CSS codes, but with the idea to have some imbalance in the X and Z part. So we say that this defines an uh, N, a code of length N, N is, is just a code of these classical codes. This is just as you're used to uh, having that. Uh, this here is different from the standard notation. We denote here the, the X weight and the Z weight, okay? To, to have a, a compact notation to see immediately what the, the X capabilities are, what the Z capabilities are. But typically, we want to have a large Z distance in our code. This actually is not new. So uh, Andrew Steen, in a, in a very early paper, had a very similar notation. He denoted it by curly braces, but he had the same idea. Just look at the, the X weight, the Z weight, and uh, he was interested in that. I don't know why that didn't, uh, that wasn't picked up, that notation, but, but he, he had ideas along these lines. Okay, so one thing it's, that is very simple to prove is a singleton bound for these codes. It basically follows for, from the singleton bounds of these two classical codes. So you get a, a singleton bound tells you that you cannot have uh, everything, right? This is like the first bound you can prove and it tells you you cannot have at the same time a high rate and a high minimum distance. So it puts some very coarse bound on that. And the version for an asymmetric code is like this. So the, the dimension is, is uh, upper bounded by N minus the dimension of the X part minus the dimension of the C part plus two. And it, of course, specializes to the case where you have a, a symmetric code when these, dx is equal to dz, then you get just your uh, n minus 2d plus 2 as you're, as you're familiar with. Right, the next thing you can do is uh, linear programming bounds. That works really exactly like in the case of stabilizer code. So you can write down using McWilliams um, uh, identity for the uh, weight enumerators of these codes. You can write down um, a system of, of um, equations uh, and you're looking for solutions to that. If you find a solution, then a code with that parameter might exist. It doesn't tell you that it exists, but it might exist. And these equations, if you look at them closely, they really look like the good old linear programming bounds. With a little twist here, we have to include this annoying thing. And this, this parameter k prime tells us where we make the cut between the x and the z part of the stabilizer, right? So we, we separate the x and the z part, we have to make a cut somewhere. So this is a kind of another parameter for our linear program. All right, that makes it a little bit uh, annoying to work with. So the way we do it is we cycle through all the possible values of K prime and then solve the linear program. There might be a smarter way to do that, but that's the way we do it right now. And from this, for instance, it follows that a 15137 code might exist. Okay, it turns later on, I will, I will show how to get this code, so this indeed exists. But it's, what is interesting to note here is that a 1515 code um, exists, but a 1517 code does not exist. Okay, you can consult Marcus's code tables, for instance, for that, it's on the web, or uh, consult some uh, papers, early papers about the GF4 
codes, for instance, contain the, the, bow, the bounds for that. So, um, so this we got from, from uh, solving these linear programs. Okay, uh, now construction. So a very simple construction is just from the good old Reed Muller codes. So Reed Muller codes have been used a lot in, in the early days of, of quantum codes. So what is a Reed Muller code? Um, you start with Boolean functions. Boolean functions just map the uh, finite field of two elements. Uh, the M tuples of that to the, the finite field of two elements. And there is a nice way of representing any Boolean function. So if you have a Boolean function of M variables, you can always write it as a, uh, an XOR of a few monomials. All right? These guys are monomials and then you can have some of them might be there, some of them might not be there. And uh, it turns out that you can write any Boolean function in this form. All of the 2 to the 2 to the M functions have a unique way of writing them in this, in this form. Having this form, you can define the degree of a, of a Boolean function just as being the maximum uh, degree of a monomial which shows up here. It's a very intuitive thing. And the read muller code of order mu is then just the, uh, the linear span of the evaluations of all the monomials up to that, de of that, de up to that degree. All right, so you put a bound on your, on your mu, you list all the monomials up to that degree, you evaluate them, you get long vectors of length 2 to the m, and you take the span of all of them. That defines a code. So as an example here, this is the read muller code in three variables of degree 2. You list all the, the functions, the, the constant one, the linear ones, the quadratic ones, and you evaluate all of them. So you get vectors of length 8 in that case, and that you take that as your generator matrix. That defines a code. So why, I, why I'm I, uh, telling you all this, um, the read muller codes have a nice property. They are uh, so-called nested codes. So if you take um, the read muller codes for a larger degree, okay, then it will encompass everything you had already before, all right? It's clear because it's the way that they're constructed. You take all the functions of degree so and so if you take a larger degree, you already have that stuff you had before. That's nice, so they are nested. Another nice property is if you look at a dual, you again get a read muller code with a different parameter, but again, you get a read muller code. So that's a very clean situation. So it can be used to, um, to define quantum codes. And actually, if you just apply the CSS construction, to, um, to this pair of codes, to these pairs of codes, you get these parameters. You get 2 to the m as a length, you get this as a dimension of your code, it's just a sum of a bunch of binomial coefficients, and uh, you get this as the x distance and that as the, the z distance of the codes. That's nice, and actually Andrew Steen was able to uh, enlarge these codes. He has a nice enlargement construction of improving, uh, of improving these codes. So after you do the enlarging construction, it's no longer, unfortunately, it's no longer CSS code, but you get a better code. So we, uh, we don't do that enlargement construction. We just work with these guys and work with these um, asymmetric codes. So you can list them for, for, for small lengths. You get codes which, uh, which show some asymmetry. Um, and you can, you can see that you have some uh, variation here in the rates and uh, correspondingly some trade-off with the asymmetry. Okay, so if, you, if you're happy with a, uh, with a small asymmetry, you can get a higher rate, but if you insist on, on, a, uh, on a large asymmetry, well, your rate also will be lower. Okay. So um, that's nice. They have some disadvantages, though, these read muller codes. You don't have enough, a lot of freedom in choosing your distance. Okay, so classically, uh, there are other families of codes where you have this kind of freedom, and uh, a very, very famous one is the class of BCH codes. Um, don't make me remember the, the names of, for which these uh, letters stand for, um, um, but they're very, they're very useful uh, classical codes um, because you can control the minimum distance of, the, of these codes all right, by a very simple process. And, um, Let's see how they can be used also to define asymmetric quantum codes. They, have a, they will have a very similar property to the Reed Muller, this nested property. Not exactly, but, but similar. Okay, so let's see how that goes. Um, the, the BCH codes, you start with a finite field uh, with Q elements, and this Q will be quite large. Right? At the end of the day, we want to come up with binary codes, but we start with a, with a really large a finite field, and we pick um, a primitive element in that field, let's call it alpha, 
and um, denote the order of that primitive element by R. And what we do is we just uh, come up with a matrix like this, and this is, uh, looks very similar to the, to the good old Fourier transform, right? DFT matrix, and this is actually what it is. It's a, it's a big Fourier matrix which you chop off at some point, all right? And the point where you chop it off, that's exactly your, your design distance. This guy you take as your parity check matrix, but you take it as a parity check matrix for code which lo lives over a smaller field. Um, alternate, so it turns out that the minimum distance of this smaller code is exactly this delta where you chop this guy off. This is nice. Um, another nice property about the code is it's a so-called cyclic code. That means if you cycle through the, the coordinates of your, of your code words, if you permute that, um, you will actually just reorder the code words. Right? So the code has a very big automorphism group, as we say. Right, so, so um, using that fact, we can write down a, a generator polynomial for the code, and it looks like this. So you take um, factors, x minus a power of this primitive element to some order, and the order comes from the so-called set of zeros of the code, and this, the zero set is, is obtained directly from this, from this choice of your exponents here. Okay, so, so um, but really what you should remember about them is that you can design the minimum distance and that they give uh, very efficient codes. Okay. So they're the, the most efficient block codes. So when people were studying finite length block codes, those were uh, the things that were best. Um, the dimensions are known. They can be bounded also in terms of that design distance. And what is important for the quantum case is you want to know something about the dual code, right? It's not enough to know just the distance, but you also want to say something about the minimum distance of the dual code. And for that, uh, it's, it makes sense to have uh, such a picture in mind, even though it's not strictly speaking correct for the case of BCH codes. It is for the case of Reed-Solomon codes, but for the case of BCH codes, but it's a good intuition. So what you want to have is um, the spectrum of your code will uh, look like this. It will have uh, a bunch of consecutive zeros, all right, namely exactly uh, delta minus one of them. And now what happens if you go to the, to the dual code is you will get the inverses of all these points, right? So they will go places. They will be permuted around because taking the inverse does not preserve this order. But what you want to have is, again, a, a large stretch of consecutive zero in the, in the spectrum, right? This determines your, your distance of the code. And it turns out that um, if you choose it right, if you're not too greedy and you pick your design distance to be less than delta max, which is roughly the square root of the length, if you do that, then the dual of that BCH code is going to be contained in the BCH code. Okay, so you cannot be too greedy, you cannot go beyond that. And also, dual of a BCH code, unfortunately, is not again a BCH code, it's different from the Reed-Muller situation. But if you're not too greedy, then you, said you have this nice nested property. And again, this was known to Steen already, but it has been improved recently by uh, Salah Ali, uh, Andreas Klappmaker, and uh, Pradeep in a, in a paper at IEEE IT. Okay, we can use that to construct asymmetric codes where we have more freedom in terms of the rate. We have a kind of a designed, uh, designed distance here for both the X and the Z part, and we can, by that, control the rate also. That's very nice, so it's straightforward to come up with some tables of codes. And here again you see that if you, if you want to increase, if you're happy to have some asymmetry in the, in, the, um, in the errors, between the X and the Z errors, you can actually gain something in terms of rate. All right? The more asymmetry you have, you get more rate, you can encode, encode more qubits into your bits. But of course you have to pay a price, and that is that you can correct less and less X errors while maintaining the same number of, of Z errors. All right, so um, let me show you something about performance simulations. So performance simulations, what does that mean? Actually, uh, David mentioned it in, in his talk about the turbo codes. Um, in a performance simulation, what you do is you, you take your code, you start to randomly introduce errors at a certain error rate. That's called the raw error rate. And um, you do that for, for different values of the error rate. And then you do your um, error correction and you look if you if you were lucky and you corrected the errors or not. Okay, and then you count how many times was I able to correct the whole thing. 
That's called a block error rate. In a classical coding theory, people want to go even further. They want to know the bit error rate. That is really how many, after you decode it, how many bits are correct. Maybe there's still some of them are correct. It's very likely that some of them are correct. But you need a lot more simulation to do that. So we are happy at this point with just block error rates. So you can plot that against a range of, of parameters here. And you can see how the performance improves. So the intuition is, and this is, um, bear with me, this, this, the engineers, um, and you, if, if you look into books, they usually usually do it in that way, counterintuitive, that the smaller probabilities are on this side, right? The smaller the probabilities get, you go further on this side. It's a little bit counterintuitive because this gets very close to zero. But they want to have these, these nice um, um, curves that look a little bit like a waterfall, all right? So you see here a symmetric code against an asymmetric code, and you see the performance is roughly the same, all right? But what is nice is the asymmetric code has a much, much higher rate. Right? This encodes only one qubit into 31. This guy encodes 11 qubits into 31 and has roughly the same performance. This is very nice. So this is an, an advantage we can play. We can have a much higher data rate with a similar performance. But there's another kind of dual thing you can play. You can um, achieve a much, much, you can have a much, much better performance than a code with a similar data rate, right? For this, we compare the 15137 code, which, by the way, we constructed using the BCH construction, against a 1515 code, right? We plotted them. And what you see here is, so this guy, this, this black guy with, a, um, with the boxes, this guy, uh, this is a symmetric code. And we plotted the asymmetric code for, for various uh, asymmetric channels, right? We can, you can control the parameter of the asymmetry. So we increased the asymmetry. First we started with no asymmetry, then we had a factor of 10, then we had a factor of 100. And we looked at how the, impo uh, the performance improved. And indeed you see that the, impo uh, the, the performance improves dramatically. This is the one, the asymmetry code where you don't assume an asymmetry in the channel. The asymmetry gets larger and you see that the, the curve dies off much, much better. Okay, this looks linear here, but this is a logarithmic plot. So it's really a dramatic improvement. And even better in a factor of 100. And here's the, the, the symmetric guy. Okay, so you see here the symmetric guy, he, he, um, he, beats, uh, um, he beats this guy, factor, the factor 10 guy. But here's actually, here's, he's worse here for that regime. Okay, no, I'm actually, okay, I gotta take that back. So that the, uh, the red curve is the, is the uh, asymmetric one for factor 10. He beats the, uh, the symmetric code for very small probabilities, but as the, pro sorry, for large probabilities, as the probabilities get smaller, the symmetric code still is better than the, the one for factor 10. But as soon as you go to factor 100, the one for 100 is better all the time than the, the symmetric code. Okay, so you can achieve a, a performance, but it's very much dependent on your actual difference between the X and the Z rates. Okay, so I'm slowly running out of time. I, I want to highlight another construction, which I think is, is um, uh, yeah, it's kind of surprising that it works at all, because um, there is this, uh, this uh, funny thing that, um, Many people want to construct quantum LDPC codes, but there's a problem with that. So, as you know from classical coding theory, LDPC codes don't perform well if, if your Tanner graph has four cycles, right? They just don't perform well. Many of the known codes don't perform well. On the other hand, if you look at a Tanner graph for a stabilizer code, it will have four cycles. So that's a major bummer, and what can you do about it? So, um, yeah. We don't know. It's a kind of really annoying situation. <laughs> and uh, it reminded me what David said, that uh, they can prove that there is no non-catastrophic code. But what they did is, OK, let's just do it. All right, let's just see if there's no, no if, even if you take a catastrophic encoder, let's see how well that guy performs. So our approach is somewhat similar to that. But I want to mention that there are other approaches actually to quantum LDPC codes. Uh, one thing is you can use this framework of entanglement enhanced codes, as mentioned by Todd in his talk, to uh, just take any classical code and make a quantum code out of it. Of course, you have the expense of using entanglement to do that. But this is certainly a way of doing it. There are other ideas of using subsystem codes, but here in this, in this talk, no subsystem codes, it's just stabilizer codes. And what we do is, 
Well, we just don't care. We take a code which has four cycles and we look at how well it performs. Right? Classically, that's quite often not what you want to do, but we pick the LDPC code carefully in such a way that the four cycles are not that harmful. But we are still able to define uh, stabilizer codes. There are other approaches, and uh, I just mentioned these papers here, and in private communication just after his talk, David told me that he's uh, coming up with something along these lines too. Okay, so uh, very briefly, how does LDPC coding work? So what you do is you start with the parity check matrix of your, of your code, and uh, you come up with a graph, it's called Tanner graph, and you plot here the, the, the information bits, okay, these correspond to the, uh, to, the, to the symbols in your encoded code word, right? If you have a code of length seven, you plot down seven data bits here, and each parity check, so each row of this matrix, corresponds to one check node in this, in this bipartite graph, right? That's called a Tanner graph, and you connect um, an input node, if and only if in the corresponding column here, you're connected to that check, right? So this guy, for instance, is connected to the check because there's a one out here. Let's look at another column, for instance, the last one, so that the last variable is connected to three checks, this X7 guy, so the first one, the second one, the third one. And translate that into a graph. So, so why do we do that? Well, it's because there's a particular decoding algorithm associated to an LDPC code, all right? You don't do bounded distance decoding anymore. Forget about all that. There's another way of doing the decoding now. So you work with that graph, and what you do is, well, suppose you have received this from your channel. So suppose in this case that we have indeed hard information from our channel. So as for the experts, it indeed, indeed turns out that these codes are very, very good if you don't have hard information, if you have something like 0 0.5, 0 0.2 and so on here. They are even better, right? But, but you can do it also for hard information. So you write that down here and you compute all the checks. So in this case, everything is fine. This indeed was a code word of the Hamming code. So all the parity checks tell us 0, 0, 0. Suppose now that an error happened on one of the the bits, so I think in this case it's this guy, no, it's this guy, which is toggled, right? Before there was a one, now there's a zero, and as an effect you will have parity checks which tell you there's something wrong, okay? This is not a code word because these two guys tell you it's wrong. So the way this message passing decoding works, okay, this is an iterative method to decode. So it works as follows. There are actually many ways to do it. One, okay, thanks. One particular way is, um, is as follows, it's called the bit flip algorithm. It's kind of the most naive thing you can come up with. First you look at which is really the culprit on the left hand side. Which, um, which of the inputs causes most of the parity checks out here to fail? And you list all these numbers. So this guy here causes one parity check to fail potentially. This guy is actually a happy guy because all the parity checks he's con connected with, they are satisfied. So we put a zero here. And we list that for all the, the variables. And we look for the max. Right? These two guys, they cause two to fail. So what this naive bit flipping algorithm does is it just, it just flips these two bits. Okay? That's just what it does. Flips these two bits and then recomputes what the syndrome is. Okay? Then in that case, the syndrome is actually one, one, one. It looks like it, it got worse, but it actually not. So, so you uh, again compute this, uh, the number of checks which the inputs violate, and you find this guy suddenly violates three of them, so now you only flip this, and as a miracle, indeed we have decoded that thing successfully. And this method works very, very well in practice, and there are many variations of that method. So that's good, that's a classical method, how do we make that quantum? So in quantum we have to put somewhere the syndrome we got from our hopefully fault-tolerant measurements, right? It's classical syndrome, so we, 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 we have to put it somewhere, and we put it here on this side. So we start with the iterative decoding actually by putting the syndrome, not like the classical guys do, they start on this side, we start on this side. So the question is what do we put here? Here we put just uh, zeros to begin with, and then we start the iterative decoding, like, like we're used to. And it turns out to be really good. So I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna sk skip all this. So this is this part is about how we construct the, uh, the quantum LDPC codes as codes having a lot of four cycles. So it looks like the performance would be bad, but our simulation showed the performance actually very, very good. Okay, I'm gonna skip all that. They're obtained by, uh, for the expert, they're obtained by finite geometries. And of course, classically, they are very well known. Our job was to prove that the dual of these codes 
have a nice property, okay? That we, that we can say something about the, the minimum distance of the dual of them, so that we can uh, come up with um, uh, the CSS construction for these for these codes. And uh, I just want to mention this thing here. Uh, we are not the first ones to propose to take an LDPC code in this fashion and to to uh, define a, um, to look at the dual and to 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 recognize the dual as a as a nice code. Uh, indeed, uh, Lev and uh, Mark, they did something uh, quite similar. They started with a BCH code, okay? Looked at very low weight code words in the BCH code and whenever they, they had one, they randomly picked one and uh, added that to a parity check matrix, okay? If you do that a couple of times, you come up with a LDPC code. The disadvantage is that this LDPC code is very irregular. So it will have a, a distance profile so distance profile is how many of the uh, of the input nodes are connected to how many of the check nodes, and you can so it's a bipartite graph. You can look at the degrees of the on the left hand side, on the right hand side. If a code is completely balanced, so it has the same, it has a constant uh, data degree and a constant check degree, then it has a very nice has a very nice performance. Uh, shows very nice performance. In particular, it typically doesn't have an error floor. So you can, as you make the probability of error smaller and smaller, the performance gets better and better. Whereas for irregular codes, they run into this snag called error floor that you cannot improve the performance anymore. So uh, we, were, we were looking into these uh, regular LDPC codes and the, the, their method doesn't show that. It seems to work uh, quite well nevertheless. So our approach is kind of dual. We start with a nice LDPC code, look at the dual and try to embed this guy into a good, L, a good BCH code for which we know the, the properties. And that's possible if you choose the parameters carefully. Okay, just to finish this, um, here's simulations for this LDPC code. And what you see is again that uh, if, if your asymmetry gets larger, the performance dramatically improves. And uh, yeah, we did this, these simulations. I think there's much more to be done because there are many ways to do this. Um, message passing decoding and also you, ma many of these codes can be explored. So just very briefly um, to wrap this up, um, so we've seen, um, I, I hope I motivated this model of asymmetric uh, or biased noise and I gave to you some constructions of asymmetric codes. Uh, as a take home message, so these codes, what are they actually good for? Unfortunately, at this point, we can only say that they're good for memory. We don't know if you can operate on them. And what I would really like to know is if you can do something like this trick where you guys um, do only diagonal gates and nevertheless are able to do uh, universal computing. I'd like to know if something like that is possible, but I, honestly, I don't know at this point. Okay, so may maybe just briefly uh, a comparison to uh, to other works where people have looked into asymmetries in channels. So actually a quite, uh, quite old paper uh, by Ran Doherty and Mabushi, they have looked at symmetric codes and studied their performance over channels which are not necessarily symmetric and, and have done some, some study of that. Um, then there was this paper I already mentioned by, by Joffe and Mezard who came up with LDPC codes and connected them to BCH codes and did some performance uh, studies. Uh, also, I, I would like to highlight this paper uh, where uh, the idea is to concatenate a, a very simple code, namely a repetition code, with an arbitrary code and um, also with a, with a goal to, to work against asymmetric noise. Right? So the big advantage here is that universal quantum computing is possible and uh, by, by carefully choosing a universal gate set for that asymmetric code. And that's a very nice, that's a very nice construction. Um, the other works I would like to mention is uh, there, there's a bunch of paper actually by these guys. They look at um, adaptive strategies for channels like the channel I mentioned in the beginning, this amplitude damping channel. And they turn out to be also, they work quite well in asymmetric regimes. So, but here the objective is a little bit different because you, you want to have um, uh, recovery operations which are kind of dynamic. So you, you change them and you adapt them to your, your channel asymmetries. Okay, and finally these guys also proposed um, to use CSS codes, but they mainly looked at um, symmetric codes with an uh, a funny way of doing asymmetric error correction that you do a lot of 
z corrections and then maybe one x correction and so on. And also did some simulations for these error modes. All right, that's all. Thanks. We have circuits for for error correction. That's uh, fault tolerant circuits. I, I assume is an implication of that question. The answer is no. So right now we just assume we have a, a bounded distance decoder. We have perfect decoding, and uh, we don't look into the logic of the, of of how to actually do the doing the decoding. We don't do that. But of course it's very important to do that as a next step. And uh, we believe that something like a Hadamard gate, for instance, that's something we cannot really have for that kind of model. Because a Hadamard would map a Z error to an X error, and that would be something like cheating nature here. If you would have a strong asymmetry towards the Z errors, you cannot just, that sounds very unphysical, at least to me, map it to a strong X bias. So, so that's something we have to work on. All right, let's thank the speaker again.